respiratory screencast video six. All right, we just got done talking about oxygen transport. Let's talk about CO2 transport. Uh, here we see the breakdown. You see there's not a uh, single molecule that's, well, I guess bicarbonate, but hemoglobin is not as responsible uh, for carrying uh, CO2. Most of it is found as a molecule called bicarbonate, which is also acts as an acid buffer. You pick it up, um, forming uh, carbonic acid and drop it off of the lungs. So it's kind of like a shuttle. This molecule picks up carbon uh, dioxide and drives it to the lungs and drops it off. 20% of it is carried by hemoglobin, but it's not bound to the same thing. It's not bound to the heme group. If you remember, the heme group is where oxygen is bound. It's bound to the amino acids. So hemoglobin that has carbon dioxide bound to it is called carb amino hemoglobin, right? Makes Carb, carbon dioxide on the amino group of hemoglobin. And the rest is dissolved in plasma. So it's a bit more diverse how you transport CO2 back from the cells uh, to the lungs. And there is a, a person's name associated with a, an effect, just like the Bohr effect. This one's called the Haldane effect. And the Haldane effect deals with CO2 rather than oxygen and the conditions under which it's likely that you'll pick up CO2. So uh, if you've got, you're down in your body tissue, so here we are down in my quads or whatever, where oxygen levels are fairly low because they've been doing squats. Where there is low oxygen, you have a capacity, increased capacity by the blood to carry CO2. So when the blood goes down into the legs, and experiences these sort of low oxygen conditions, they, the blood really gets hungry for CO2 and picks it up there. When you get back to the lungs where there's lots of oxygen, you just took a deep breath, that's going to cause a decrease in the blood's carrying capacity for CO2. So it's really kind of the reverse of the situation you had with the Bohr effect. Bohr effect, conditions in the lungs let you pick up oxygen, conditions in the legs let you drop off oxygen. Haldane effect, Conditions in the lungs make you drop off CO2. Conditions in the legs make you pick up CO2. So the, the shuttle bus is going both directions, right? You pick up passengers in the legs, drop them off at the lungs, and you pick up different passengers in the lungs, and you drop them off in the legs. So Bohr effect, O2, Haldane effect, CO2, and they work kind of in opposite directions. Next slide, I think. Let's see. Yeah, that we did that one. This is the first slide here, so let's talk about this. Uh, we're switching gears here. Hypoxia, you've heard of it before. It's when you don't get enough oxygen to your tissues. There uh, are a couple of different classes that will, you know, have hypoxic conditions. Anemic is if you just don't have enough red blood cells or the hemoglobin doesn't work. Ischemic, I'll pronounce these. Ischemic is if you have bad circulation, so you've got... Uh, blocked arteries or the heart doesn't work correctly, uh, you know, really low blood pressure, that kind of thing. Histotoxic. Histo, tissue, toxic. You know, toxic, right? So something's wrong with your cells. You've gotten poisoned and you can't absorb the oxygen. You could be breathing it in all you want, but it's not going to be dropped off at your brain and your muscle and your heart. So that's how cyanide kills you, by the way. Uh, hypoxemic, so hypoxemic, so low oxygen, low oxygen reaching the blood from the lungs. This, if you drown, you're going to experience hypoxemic hypoxia because water doesn't carry as much oxygen uh, that we can use anyway as air does. We're not built for that kind of thing. So you're breathing in water, you're going to die from this. You're breathing in space. Let's say you go out of the air. Let's say you get out of the space shuttle without your suit on, right? That'll, you know, then you'll die. Well, you probably die from the dra the dramatic uh, pressure drop, but your your blood will boil. But anyway, this will this won't help. Um, carbon dioxide poisoning is a special one because uh, it's weird. Uh, turns out that our hemoglobin, which has evolved over, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of years, really. Our hemoglobin has uh, the ability to pick up oxygen. It's been 
carefully selected for that. But weirdly, it picks up carbon monoxide before it'll pick up oxygen. And that's just a glitch in the matrix. Turns out that high levels of carbon monoxide were never found around animals that were evolving hemoglobin. So there was never a worry, you know, like what if there's carbon monoxide around, what am I gonna do? It was never around. If it was, you were probably in a forest fire and you probably weren't gonna make it anyway. But nowadays we have, you know, our stoves will produce carbon monoxide, our furnaces will produce carbon monoxide, internal combustion engines produce carbon monoxide. So if you're around an atmosphere that's got a lot of CO, carbon monoxide, you're gonna start picking that up. And the real diabolical part here is that you're not gonna really notice it because your alarm bells aren't gonna go off until it's too late. So scary, uh, don't breathe carbon monoxide. How do you control respiration? Let me see what I got the next page. It's just this one. So um, let me make sure, More respiration. This one kind of merges, but all right. Uh, neural mechanisms, how your nervous system controls it. And I'm gonna simplify this by saying there are respiratory centers in your medulla, which will stimulate the nerves that power the muscles that let you breathe. So when you're not even thinking about it, these guys are gonna kind of fire off every 12, uh, or I should say every five seconds or so, giving you 12 breaths per minute. You take on average, it feels like you take more, right? But uh, if you measured it, or if somebody else measured your breathing, if you think about it, you might change it. If somebody else measured your breathing, you'd see you're probably rocking out about 12 a minute. And that state is called eupnea. Bless you. Eupnea is like relaxed breathing. The phrenic nerve stimulates your diaphragm. So when you want to depress that diaphragm, that nerve's going to take that message. The intercostal nerves stimulate the external, or both intercostal muscles, but you're going to want to uh, contract the external ones to breathe in. So that's the direct control. And that is video six.